I'm free to start. Great, thank you, Roshni. Hello and welcome to each of you to today's webinar. We're glad you cho chose to join us. My name is Brenda Lamy and I'm the Vice President of Professional Leadership Development at the college. To begin, we respectfully acknowledge that we are broadcasting today from the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg peoples. We are also pleased to be joined today by people from coast to coast to coast who like us live, work and play on lands that have been inhabited by First Nations, Métis and Inuit peoples and call this nation home. I would also like to acknowledge the indigenous culture of knowledge sharing that leverages collective experience and allows people to learn from one another, providing an opportunity for personal and collective capacity to develop and advance. I believe we have a lot to learn about intergenerational and traditional knowledge sharing and hope that it is in that spirit of sharing and learning that you join us today. I invite all attendees to reflect on the territories you are participating from as we commit ourselves to gaining knowledge, forging a new culturally safe relationship and contributing to reconciliation. The college is pleased to have partnered with BD to bring today's webinar to you. I've had the opportunity to read through the slides and I'm really looking forward to hearing more. A little bit about BD, they joined the college in 2002 and we have also partnered with them to bring you a webinar this past June, uh, reviewing COVID-19 epidemiology and health system impact, and also partnered with them to develop the National Excellence in Patient Safety Award, a partnership that will be in place until at least 2023. In 2008, BD received the President's Award for Outstanding Corporate Membership in the college. Today's speakers include Arthi Chandran, Vice President of Health Economics and Outcomes Research at BD. Ron Johnson, Vice President, Services and Rural Health Chief Information Officer, Eastern Health. Lena Cuthbertson, Professional Executive, or Provincial Executive Director, Office of Patient-Centered Measurement, BC Ministry of Health. The objectives of today's webinar are to examine global readiness and enablers of value-based healthcare and procurement goals demonstrate the operationalizing of value-based procurement in health systems to enable value-based healthcare, understand the patient perspective in value-based healthcare and showcasing patient reported experience and outcome measurement. So we're gonna kick off today's webinar with a poll, which best describes which industry you primarily work in. We'll give you a few seconds here to submit your answer. And there we have the results. So we have a diversity of, of audience. So we welcome you all. And I'm gonna turn it over to Arthi to uh, begin the presentation. Thanks, Brenda. Um, I'm, I'm really excited to be here today and talk about this really important topic. It really represents how we uh, are collectively speaking to evolve the way we achieve the outcomes that matter. And so I'd like to start by talking about value on the next slide. Value is really in the eye of the beholder. When we ask people to define what value means to them, a physician may refer to um, the quality of the care uh, that they're delivering. The payer or insurer may think about cost, uh, the cost of care, cost of delivery, and patients, of course, are going to talk about outcomes. But what's common in healthcare is that the shared end goal for everyone involved is the outcomes that matter the most to patients. And that's really what um, value-based care is all about. Uh, what we see on the next slide is a figure that breaks down um, different relationships between manufacturers, payers, and healthcare providers that really aims to deliver the outcomes that matter the most to patients. And in today's session, you're gonna be hearing about how institutions have really operationalized value-based mechanisms to deliver these outcomes. But as all of you in the audience can appreciate, there are a variety of terms that are used out there and often interchangeably when we're talking about these different value-based mechanisms. So I wanna just take a moment and break some of these down for you. So first there's value-based healthcare. 
this term is often misused as an overarching term for all value-based uh, contractual relationship. Um, but really, uh, value-based healthcare was designed to shift the incentive model between payer bodies as well as healthcare providers to focus on patient outcomes. So in essence, the, the reward uh, or payment mechanism was uh, intended to shift from patient served to the quality of outcomes delivered. Value-based uh, contracting um, is a term that actually uh, references the contractual agreement between either a payer or a care delivery site directly with the manufacturer. These agreements incentivize something different. They incentivize the performance of products or perhaps the performance of services. And they can be measured in a, in a variety of different ways. They can be measured by patient outcomes but they can also be measured by things like workflow efficiency. So really offering a spectrum of um, ways to both deliver and capture value. Value-based pricing is when there is a price that's commensurate with how everyone understands and defines the value that's being delivered. And when we start to use value-based contracting, to enable value-based healthcare at the right price, that's really when the magic happens. That's when patients are gonna benefit um, the most from this construct. But the construct's complex and uh, it's gonna require all of us to come together in ways that are unfamiliar to us. Um, we're starting to. And you'll see on the next slide that value-based contracts can take on many forms based on the need of the, the end user, the customer. The frequency, however, with which these types of engagements are offered and executed is still highly variable. In the US, there are many companies that are really looking for paths forward in delivering value in new ways, um, such as reducing complexity in a payment within a procedure. Um, or sharing risk in outcomes, whether those outcomes are financial outcomes or patient outcomes or even quality of service. I think what's important here to note is that despite the frequency um, of execution, manufacturers are trying and um, they're exploring a variety of different ways to deliver value. And we see a similar trend um, in the EU on the next slide. So after a directive on um, public procurement was passed by the European Parliament back in 2014, uh, procurement practices started to evolve. They took on a wider lens that really included factors such as quality and socioeconomic benefit. This really opened the doors to investing in value in new ways. And although both you know, med tech and procurers, uh, as you can see on the slide, really see a lot more opportunity for improvement, uh, experience and maturity, it's important to note here that there's a shared drive, a shared drive to evolve the way we collectively capture value. And in fact, early adopters of these mechanisms, uh, including the NHS in UK, um, Dutch Health Authority, Ireland, as well as Catalonia, amongst, amongst others in Europe, um, they already are seeing the benefits of, um, of this practice, the intended benefits of value-based contracting, which include improved patient outcomes um, at a lower total cost. And um, these early, er, early adopters are looking to scale these practices um, in, their, in their regions. But to achieve um, the benefits that they're starting to achieve, both manufacturers, providers, and, and insurance organizations need to really keep a couple things in mind. And so if we move to the next slide, a few of these areas for consideration include the way value is delivered. Um, value needs to be defined and delivered the way the end user, the customer defines value. When we think about um, you know, how to prioritize and go after these opportunities, the return on investment and the priority for the customer should really dictate what the opportunity is, not the magnitude of the engagement. 
And manufacturers absolutely um, should do whatever they can to limit the complexity, not add additional complexity to what's already a multifaceted approach. On the insurer and provider side, know your goals. Um, you know, understand what value means to you. Uh, focus on outcomes and, and total cost of care as opposed to price. Um, and really think about the journey, not the quick win. When we think about these types of mechanisms to um, capture value, it's, it's not about the sprint, it's, it's a marathon. And when these mindsets start to shift on, on all sides, that's really what's gonna create a winning framework, a framework that benefits the patient at the end of everything we seek to do. So I know there's gonna be question, uh, opportunity for questions at the end. So um, let's go ahead and take a quick poll. So has your organization engaged in a value-based healthcare or contracting initiative? Yes, yeah, so it looks like um, half of you uh, have uh, started, have started to, to practice in this space. And so that's great. I think that um, that's very reflective of the experimental nature of what's happening um, around the world when it comes to uh, value-based contracting, value-based care. So um, I'm going to turn it over to Ron Johnson, who, as Brenda mentioned, is the VP of Information Services and Rural Health, as well as the Chief Information Officer for Eastern Health, to talk a little bit more about how he's put some of these uh, concepts into action. So, Ron? Uh, thank you, Arthi, and uh, thanks, everyone, for having me today. Uh, so what, what I'm going to do is sort of outline Eastern Health's uh, value, its, its journey to value-based uh, in doing that, I'm first going to give you a little bit of information about Eastern Health from scope and size. Um, I'm going to give you a little overview of our innovation strategy, and that's where our value-based procurement strategy is embedded. I'm going to talk about some enabling policies that, that have allowed us to go down this road, and then we're going to go through some examples. Can I get the next slide, please? Next one. Yeah, so a little bit about Eastern Health. So Eastern Health is the largest integrated uh, health authority in the province of Newfoundland. Uh, we have a provincial mandate and we're tertiary and academic health sciences. Looking at the map there, you can see we cover basically the Avalon Peninsula, the Bonavista Peninsula, and the Buren Peninsula. And we provide provincial services to the whole tertiary provincial services to the whole province. Next slide, please. So just from a, a scope perspective, we offer the full continuum of care uh, as an integrated health authority. Uh, our budget is around 1.6 billion, we have close to 13,000 employees. And, and uh, you know, at any given time, uh, we we're, we're, have a couple thousand volunteers and, you know, a little over 4,000 student placements. So it's a pure size organization, the largest employer, by the way, in the province of Newfoundland. Next slide. So really, when we started to uh, look at value-based procurement, we, we, it was at the same time as we started to look and launch innovation. So our definition of innovation at Eastern Health is, is, is not necessarily around technology. It's around novel and high impact ideas and technologies and processes that drive transformation of the health and well-being of a population, um, our health system, and also at the same time to help uh, with economic development within the province. Next slide. And our vision, certainly, you know, our vision is to harness innovation to advance patient care and elevate Eastern Health as a leader in the Canadian health innovation sector. And, you know, as we started to go down the innovation journey, patients uh, have been a part of every step of the way as, as advisors and as, as, you know, giving meaningful, we have them meaningfully engaged and giving good input. Next page, next slide. 
So with our innovation strategy, what we what we hope to do is advance healthcare services and programs uh, in Eastern Health through the you know, application of innovative solutions. Another one is to maximize, maximize health system efficiencies and to minimize associated costs. And, and lastly, to generate economic development. Next, please. And obviously looking at our, uh, our dimensions or our pillars in our innovation strategy, we have five. The one I'm gonna focus on today is around value-based procurement to enable innovation. Next, please. And you can see we started in 2016 uh, on our innovation journey, and that was launched by, through a hacking health uh, that we participated in. And from there, we've had we've done various enabling uh, enabling uh, tactics to uh, to enable innovation. And one of those tactics, obviously, is value based procurement. And I'll get into the meat of that uh, in the next next slide, please. So when we look at we look at uh, value based procurement. You know, we were looking at different enablers that, that allowed us to move down this road. And the big one, an external policy enabler, was the government of Newfoundland introduced a new public procurement act in 2018. And this act actually allowed us to, to, uh, to use novel techniques such as value-based procurement. It transformed a lot of the traditional approaches to procurement, especially in Newfoundland. Really, we only have one tool, and that was tendering. And that was that typically involved uh, detailed uh, specification and awarding to the lowest qualified bidder to meet spec. Didn't have a lot of room in the act to allow for uh, novel innovative approaches to procurement, but the new act has, and that's been in place since 2018. Next, please. And internally, so internally, we also looked at a number of internal enablers. And one of those is that we created the value-based procurement policy. We did a the family center care policy. We developed and implemented the value-based procurement strategy. And all of this is wrapped up into our next iteration of our strategic plan, our 2020 to 2023 strategic plan. Next, please. So our value-based procurement policy, actually we formalized it in October of 2019. We use it in conjunction with all procurement related policies and, and activities within the organization. It's detailed that it, it gives seven approaches to value-based procurement. It also provides which circumstances you would use value-based and it outlines necessary steps. It was developed by a health economist and, and the policy has guided us through multiple uh, value-based procurement initiatives that I'll go through in a minute. Next, next, next slide, please. Another big enabler, enabler in value-based and, and value overall, I mean, really value is, is harnessing, you know, harnessing what patients want and what they need. And a big part of that was uh, for us is, is implementing a client family center care policy. We implemented that in 2017. We have client patient advisors on every initiative uh, that we do from a value-based procurement perspective. And really, they, they provide integral, yeah, integral advice when we, when we go down this road. And, and really, they're a part of everything we do. I mean, it's really the key to, to us enabling value-based initiatives. Next, please. We also uh, developed and implemented the value-based procurement strategy. And, and as I indicated, that's enabled by the new Public Procurement Act. Again, it's based on best practice. We've also had advice from Scan Health and Snowden. And right now, we, we actually, every value-based procurement initiative that we undertake, we actually have our evaluation department formally evaluate, uh, evaluate these initiatives to ensure we're getting value. Next, please. And I guess another enabler is in our strategic plan. Uh, it's uh, value-based procurement is interwoven in the new iteration of the plan. And there is one indicator that's dedicated to value-based procurement. Next, please. So to all of that, I mean, I think the, the secret sauce in what we've done is that we use the Public Procurement Act to effectively engage the private sector. I think we're unique in the country in that manner. So we have, we have 10, 10 uh, innovation partners, and they're listed here on the slide, and they're some of the biggest medical companies in the world, uh, IT companies, there's some local Newfoundland, Atlantic Canadian, and Canadian. 
Uh, we utilized the Public Procurement Act to bring these on. Um, and when we did that, we first went out to market uh, using the new act for innovation partners. We didn't really know, you know, it was very, it was a very limited call. We, we, we just put out there, you know, Eastern Health is, is uh, implementing an innovation strategy. And would you like to be an innovation partner? It was as simple as that, uh, the RFP. We had over 30 respondents on the first one. We, we picked five. The second one, we did a second one because we wanted to broaden, broaden out the, uh, the team or, or our, our vendor partner for private sector partners. And then the second time we had over 20 responses and we added five. So we have 10. And how we do value base currently, uh, we do it, we do limited and we do open calls. But with these 10, we typically do limited calls for value-based procurement initiatives. And we also do open public calls depending on the initiative. But this really is, 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 is the secret in, in what we've been able to accomplish. I'm gonna outline a few examples now. Next one, please. The first one is actually uh, buying an outcome. And this is a very interesting project. Uh, partnered on this one with uh, Medtronic. Uh, and we're actually have a small cohort of patients in a small rural area that will actually be procuring uh, an outcome for diabetes. Uh, the way the contract uh, is structured is that the, uh, the vendor partnership, the, the private sector partner is to deliver that outcome and payment is tied to the outcome. I think there's been a few maybe attempts at similar ones across the country. Right now on this particular one, we're in the contracting phase. Next one, please. This one is active currently. Uh, this one was an open call uh, to, uh, to, to the, uh, I guess, to the private sector in general and it's for close of medication. The idea here is to have an automated and integrated uh, medication management process with advanced analytics and has machine learning and actionable intelligence. Um, and again, this is a value-based procurement. It's in process. And the idea here is to, is to improve patient safety, but also to bring value back to patients. And that can be uh, both from an efficiency perspective, but also from a safety perspective. Next one, please. The next one, this is a fairly large one. This one is in the final stages. Um, this is a vested contract for those not familiar with that approach. It's, it's out of the University of Tennessee. Uh, we've been uh, training our staff here. Uh, they have the vested approach as a series of tools and, and methods to actually get to a value-based contract. We're using it currently for our sports services. Uh, it's a $70 million annual contract. We just recently awarded this to Compass. And the idea with this one, and this is a, there's a whole bunch of methodology and research behind it, instead of carving up the pie, it's to grow the pie. And, and payment on this one, there is a base payment, but payment is tied to performance and it's an incentive-based payment system. We will finalize the full contract on this one before the end of December, and this one will go into, uh, go into uh, operation on January 1st of 2021. The difference in this next slide, please. The next one is one that uh, we just, it's a provincial, this is a provincial one. It was a open call. Uh, partner would change healthcare on this particular one. And uh, this one here is for workforce managing, staff scheduling, but also for total uh, capacity management and patient flow. This was a performance-based uh, value-based contract with a, uh, it has a, a mobilization payment, a small mobilization payment. The contract itself is probably valued at over 35 million. Uh, payment on this one is totally from savings. And, and once the system is paid for, there will be a split in the uh, savings going forward. We at Eastern Health, we anticipate in saving anywhere from five to $8 million a year uh, with a very small capital upfront and everything else is included in the savings model. This one now contract to sign going into operation sometime within the next 12 months. Uh, next slide, please. And a little bit about the solution. Uh, this here is, is basically a patient flow, uh, schedule, uh, staff scheduling to acuity and capacity planning based on history and other types of inputs. Next, please. 
So those are some that we have currently in place. We are also now developing a couple of other strategies around hypothetical uh, patient cases and also pre-tender product testing. We anticipate we'll go to the market with, with uh, two types to experiment with these types of methods as well. Next, please. So here's a poll. So what type of value-based contracting model is most attractive to your organization? And we'll get the results. So it seems here, um, outcomes guarantee seems to be the biggest draw followed by risk share. Yeah, and those, those, type, those two types are, are, are probably the easier ones to do with, with, from an effort perspective. So thanks, I'll now pass it over to the next speaker. And Lena Cuthbertson is going to come up. So I'll pass it over to Lena, thank you. Thank you, Ron, and thank you to CCHL and BD for the invitation to join today's conversation. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to showcase our efforts in British Columbia to examine procurement value from what is arguably the most important perspective, the perspective of the people receiving healthcare services. My contribution to today's discussion will be on how in British Columbia, we measure patient self-reported outcomes and patient self-reported experiences in an effort to create value across the entire patient journey. Our goal in British Columbia is to give the people who use and the people who need healthcare services in our province a voice in providing an assessment of the quality and the safety of their care. We call this patient-centered measurement. And we conduct this measurement with the guiding principle that at the heart of every data point in healthcare is a person. Next slide. Patient-centered measurement and values-based healthcare both focus on the same thing, what matters to patients. However, while values-based healthcare links investments in healthcare to those defined and selected by patients, patient-centered measurement gives patients, the people who use or the people who need healthcare services, the platform for evaluating if those products and services meet their needs and expectations. When we ask patients to evaluate their experience of care, we are asking about whether their care addresses and respects their needs, their values and their preferences, whether information was provided in a way they can understand, whether pain was addressed or managed, whether family were involved as much as they wanted. In short, we're asking patients to evaluate the quality and the safety of their care. And when we ask patients to evaluate their outcomes of care, we're asking if interventions, procedures, devices, or treatments have had an impact on their health-related quality of life and their clinical outcomes. In short, have these interventions, have these products, have these devices made a difference in their assessment of their general health status, their physical health status, their mental and emotional well being, their functional abilities, their ability to carry out their daily routines. By asking patients about their experiences and their outcomes, we get at what matters the most to them. This is the concept of personal value. Next slide, please. Our provincial initiative to measure what matters to patients began in 2002. And for those of you who are familiar with British Columbia, this was just after we formed the health authority structure in our province. And this initiative continues to this day as a collaborative initiative of the BC Ministry of Health, all of our health authorities, including First Nations Health Authority and their affiliate organizations. Next slide, please. Our mandate is to implement a coordinated, meaning all in, no cherry picking, every location in the province participates, scientifically rigorous, meaning we ensure a representative sample of the population of patients, not one person sitting on a committee giving advice from their perspective, but a representative sample of the population of patients served in a particular sector, program, or initiative. 
that are selected to provide feedback using validated instruments, not homegrown tools with no evidence that they measure what they intend to measure. Our initiative is cost effective, meaning it's large scale. It's a large scale project in every case for which we receive the records of every encounter in the sector of interest. And the example I will be sharing today garnered 14,076 responses. The initiative is provincial, meaning all patients are invited to participate across all sites, across all regions, all using the same instrument at the same time in the same way. So the mode, whether it's paper, online, et cetera. Our deliverable is the collection of information such that it can be used to enhance performance monitoring and accountability at the system level, support local and cross-sector quality improvement and evaluation, and inform research by providing patient records that are linkable to other clinical and administrative databases for secondary analysis. Next slide. Dr. Rick Sawatsky, Canada Research Chair in Person-Centered Outcomes, and I coined the expression, PREMS plus PROMS equal better together. PROMS ask patients to tell us, how are they doing? They measure aspects of patients' self-reported health and quality of life from their point of view, with no middle person, not a clinician's view of their health-related quality of life, their own view. And PREMS ask patients to tell us how is or how was your care experience. An experience of care is an outcome in its own right. PREMS and PROMS together calculate health and well-being gains using pre and post intervention surveys. In BC, we ask patients to complete a PREM and a PROM to measure changes in health and well being, patient, giving patients a voice in measuring the efficiency of treatments, procedures, or interventions based on their priorities. Next slide, please. Patient centered measurement is driven by the desire to understand and improve health related experiences and outcomes of relevance to patients' quality of life. Our survey results are transformed into data, but only when we translate the data into information. Information that is geared to varying audiences, the public, clinicians, policymakers, healthcare leaders, and patients, does it become information that informs our tests of change and our progress towards the goal of the triple, the goals, goals, plural, of the triple aim. Better health, better care, and better use of resources for individuals and for society culminating in better quality of life for our patients. Next slide, please. Since 2003, we've collected feedback using PREMS and PROMS from 17.9 million patients in 13 sectors and subsectors. And I'm very proud to say that includes two COVID-19 surveys implemented since March in every emergency department in BC, every acute care hospital, and across all publicly funded long-term care and assisted living sites looking at visitor restrictions since the start of the pandemic. Can you say agile? <laughs> Next slide. It gives me great pleasure today to showcase a project our office has supported to examine the value of the investments in British Columbia from the patient perspective in partnership with the supplier of IV therapy supplies, Becton Dickinson. Our joint goal was to understand the experience of intravenous therapy from the patient perspective. Next slide, please. So why explore IV therapy from the patient perspective? Well, firstly, because infections from peripherally inserted IV lines ranked as one of the top 10 patient safety concerns in 2019. Next slide, please. Why else? Because even without solicitations, solicitation, patients who answered our acute inpatient survey in 2016-17, so all 78 acute care hospitals and two freestanding rehab facilities, provided 290 narrative comments about their IVs when they were asked, what is the one thing we should change to improve your experience? And that feedback about their experiences of an IV insertion were not always as good as they or we would have hoped. In the words of a BC patient, I had a horrible experience with everyone trying to access a vein. It took nurses, it took six nurses, approximately 20 tries to locate a vein. It was awful. My arm was so very bruised and sore. I went from one person to the next 
and no one could draw blood or get a line for a CT scan. I've never had such a horrible experience. Other than that, everything was wonderful. Thankfully in British Columbia, our patients are very resilient. And finally, next slide. The reason to explore IV therapy from the patient perspective is because 90% of hospitalized, hospitalized patients get IVs. But unfortunately, up to half of those IVs fail to meet their therapy goals. And spoiler alert, in British Columbia, the results from our 2018 survey of patients who received an IV in one of British Columbia's 108 emergency departments showed that patients reported at least one complication 53% of the time. And why would this come as a surprise? When you consider all the steps necessary for preparation, placement, care, and maintenance of an IV, that one line could be accessed or handled hundreds of times over its dwell. These touches will be made by a wide range of clinicians working with varying skill levels, new grads, experienced um, clinicians on different shifts in dif different departments to achieve different therapy goals. They'll be using multiple products with different, differing instructions for use. And that doesn't even include the variables that the patient brings to the bedside, their age, their condition of vasculature, and of course, the reason they've been hospitalized in the first place. Next slide. A collaboration began in March 2017 between British Columbia's Office of Patient-Centered Measurement, our office, patients with lived experience of intravenous therapy, clinical e experts, and BD, um, BC's vendor of IB therapy supplies. We started by working with a conceptual framework that had already been developed by BD, and we mapped the patient um, experience of IV therapy to understand, next slide, where and how the experience of IV therapy could be impacted during the patient's healthcare journey. This information was used to develop a patient-reported survey about patient experiences of IV therapy in order to assess the quality and safety of IV therapy from the patient perspective. Next slide, please. The survey that we developed was cognitively tested, so asking patients whether or not the questions were measuring what we intended to measure, so asking them to tell us what the questions meant in their own words, and whether they measured what was important to them, to patients. The survey was implemented in every one of BC's 108 emergency departments between January and March of 2018, and I've already mentioned we had over 14,000 respondents. An important component of this work was that before the survey went to the field, our lower mainland IV therapy working group of clinical experts developed targets for performance for each question. Next slide. The results showed significant differences between pediatric and adult first stick success and complication rates. In addition, Across all age groups, patients reported that they were not consistently advised to report complications with their IVs. They were not being asked to report if they experienced pain, redness, bruising, bleeding, soreness. Next slide. So early indications of poor scores well below the targets that have been established by our clinical experts to the questions that asked patients whether they were told what to expect and when to call a nurse prompted the development of a patient information card that was piloted at two hospital emergency department. The card describes what an IV is, what will happen when the patient receives an IV, and lists the common problems that patients should watch out for and tell their nurse about. BD developed the patient information card for this Plan Do Study Act test of change in the two emergency departments. Next slide. And weekly, we collected, we reported uh, provincial, BC, regional, and site level reports using our web based dynamic analysis and reporting tool that we call the DART. Next slide. Run charts showed weekly changes in scores, and narrative comments from patients were used to illustrate the data in close to real time. Results were presented against the targets established by clinicians in the Lower Mainland IV Therapy Working Group. And analysts from our office provided observations to facilitate understanding of the trends and proposed actions. Next slide. In this slide, we see that question IV5, which asked if patients were told to call a nurse if they had any problems, never at a provincial level achieved the 80% top box score provincially. 
although promising changes occurred at the two sites where the patient information card was piloted. Next slide. A review of the results of our Made in BC IV therapy survey led to the development of three working groups of clinicians to address education to support nursing competencies related to IV therapy, development of patient education communication materials that align with patient safety principles so that patients are taking responsibility for their own care and building leadership and stakeholder awareness of the return on the investment of paid time for nursing education to increase patient satisfaction and decrease adverse events related to IV therapy. Next slide. I'm proud that we have, that we have made the Made in BC BC Patient Experiences for IV Therapy Survey available as a non-proprietary instrument and have promoted its use through oral and poster presentations nationally and internationally through journal publications, a publication this month in the Vascular Access Journal of the Canadian Vascular Access Association and an invitation to publish in the British Journal of Nursing and through a call to action for the development of international standards for vascular access by the International Society for Quality in Healthcare with the support of Accreditation Canada and Health Standards Organization. Next slide. Our focus on the patient experience of IV therapy has shown that when vendor partnerships are in place, meaning that our IV therapy vendor is at the table as an equal partner with clinicians, analysts and patients, the partnership increases value in terms of quality, safety, risk, ethics, patient-centered, evidence-based, and cost-effective care. And our journey continues as we, as we have more work to do with BD and our Lower Mainland IV Therapy Working Group on QI initiatives within our health authorities to monitor and measure improvements in both clinically reported and patient-reported outcomes and experiences. We have now also fielded the survey with 13,000 outpatient cancer care patients in 2019 and 14,000 patients who are providing feedback about their experiences as they transition between providers, locations, and sectors in 2020. And the survey has expanded to explore the use of IV therapy devices in home care settings, as well as the quality of the instructions provided to patients about care and maintenance of their devices at home. This project has shown us what is possible when the focus is on what matters to our patients and when that information informs our commitment to ensure what matters is measured. It has also positioned us for engaging our shared services procurement processes to procure for outcomes as an important consideration in the procurement for products. Next slide. I wanna conclude by thanking the members of the Lower Mainland IV Therapy Working Group, our vendor partner, BD, and all the patients who provided their feedback about their experiences and outcomes of IV therapy. On the next slide, I've provided selective resources if you're keen to learn more about our work and our journey, and if you'd like more information about the survey, please do not hesitate to contact myself and Sarah Ashton, who led this work on behalf of BD Canada. I know that patient experience and outcome measurement is now almost as much her favorite topic of conversation as it is mine. Thank you. All right, thanks, thanks, Lena, and um, you know, really, really great work uh, and outstanding impact. I think we have a, another polling question here. Um, which outcome would you most be interested in seeing um, via uh, value-based uh, healthcare approaches? I guess we should have Arthi added an option for um, um, the outcome of uh, what matters to patients. Patient safety, also something that matters to patients. Yeah. Thank you for that. And Lena, thank you for your presentation. Great outcomes, as I mentioned. And, and we've seen today that, you know, there has been success with value-based initiatives in Canada from coast to coast. So thank you both, Ron and Lena, for sharing your leadership 
for sharing your organizational approach um, and really for giving us examples on how we can implement value-based approaches in Canada. I encourage all of you in the audience to think about um, new and innovative ways to drive uh, your desired outcomes and also consider how you can enable value-based procurement in your healthcare system. Um, do we have one more poll? On the next slide. No, that was just the four of them. All right. Well, then um, let's uh, let's turn it over to questions. We welcome any questions at this time. Brenda, I think you're on yeah. mute. <laughs> I just noticed that. It wouldn't be a webinar if you didn't hear those words. <laughs> Um, starting off with a question um, for the panelists, wondering how you initiated value-based healthcare in your regions. I can take a stab. Yeah, so so at Eastern Health, I mean, it, we, as I indicated in the, in the presentation, it started out as a part of our innovation strategy, and and you know obviously uh, to embed it in the organization took enablers such as the change in the, in the uh, policy of the Public Procurement, Procurement Act and also internal policy enablers. And you need senior leadership buy-in. I mean, to do these, to do these types of, of procurements, are, they're complex and you need senior leadership buy-in. That's key. Yeah, absolutely. Lena? Um, well, I think my perspective is so focused on the value to patients, right? So um, from my perspective, the work that we do is focused on, oh, hurt my video. Sorry about that. So from my perspective, the focus is on what matters to patients and making sure that we collect that information in a scientifically rigorous way so that it can be information that we bring to the table to bring the patient perspective to the heart of procurement decisions. And also that, so that we continue to work with our vendors um, to look at where can we improve, um, not just the device, but how the device uh, interacts in the real world with patients and that that information can be provided in close to real time. Hence, you know, I tried to showcase a little bit our DART and I invite anyone to contact us if they want to get access because we want to provide that information to be able to inform local QI. Great, thank you. So it's, it's, it looks like it's a, it's a multi-pronged approach. You've got, you need the senior leader, leader's engagement and you need the patient engagement to really make it happen. And then, and then you've got this foundational shift. Um, we have a question here from Mark Bilodeau. Hi, Mark. Um, is this an approach that is gaining traction in our provincial government's Ministry of Health currently? Yeah, I, I think uh, so. Our ministry here in the province of Newfoundland is is well versed in, in what we're doing as a regional health authority. And in fact, uh, one of the projects that I had um, talked about there, the one with um, workforce management and the uh, capacity and patient flow, that particular procurement is provincial in nature and, and the province, uh, Department of Health and Community Service within the province is on the committee, on the team. So they've embraced the concept here in the province of Newfoundland. Lena, did you have anything to add? There you go. I would just add that it was at the request of our assistant deputy minister in British Columbia that we put our, you know, big toe into the water, dip it in and start exploring values-based procurement that led to this um, project that we did uh, with BD. So I would say the planets aligned, there was interest, there was a desire. And um, because of the work that I do in the area of patient-centered measurement, the um, uh, trying to find a way to explore how we bring the patient perspective and the patient uh, voice forward, not just to assess uh, patient safety, not just to assess quality of care, but also to look at value from the perspective of our investments in healthcare. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Can yeah. I add another point? Sure. Well? Yeah. Uh, 
I know that most of the questions in the presentations really focused on from a provider perspective and, and also who's engaged from a provider perspective, patients, government, so forth and so on. But another big piece of value-based procurement, and I noticed 32% of our attendees today are from the med tech sector, is that as medical uh, technology vendors, you also have to be ready to, to enter this value-based procurement stream. And, and I know from working on multiple projects currently, not all vendors are ready. Hmm. And I really uh, would take uh, the 32% of our attendees today. Uh, I think you are going to see a shift in the, in the uh, procurement sector in the country where you're going to see more value-based uh, procurements and more value-based healthcare because really value is is it can be financial, can be system efficiencies, can be patient safety, but it is the things that matter most to patients. And I think that I think that as providers, we're starting to get ready. But I really encourage the med tech sector as well to, to really turn the covers and start to get ready because I do think that across the country there's going to be more and more of this going on. Yeah, that's that's a great point, Ron. And I'd like to build on that because um, you know I had I talked about uh, everybody's mind sh mindset shifting, and that's exactly what you're you're talking about as well. Um, a survey that we did in the U.S. to understand um, you know the the med tech industry's uh, perspective and maturity um, in this space, as well as um, our, our providers maturity uh, indicates the same that, you know, our uh, healthcare institutions, healthcare delivery sites are looking to uh, invest in value in these new ways, but they're also looking for their vendor partners, their suppliers to help drive that shift as well and bring some education to the table. Everybody is in the same state of maturity within our own silos and really working together to be able to figure out how this trifecta really is uh, unlocked and the potential of this part, these partnerships are unlocked to be able to enable outcomes for our patients is the journey that we're on together and everybody needs to show up at that table equally. So that's a great point. Mm -hmm. yeah, you like we are, uh, healthcare procurement has been focused on aggregation, right? That's our whole strategy. It's typically been about volume, volume and aggregation. And this is a big shift. Right? It is a big shift to move from a volume aggregation to value. And, and it's a big shift for everyone. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. No, thank you. And, and I, it has me thinking about the LEADS framework and, and, and that the developed coalitions mm -hmm. leading to the systems transformation. And this is what I'm hearing as a, as a foundational message from today's webinar. We have another question here from Paula Rosansky. Hi, Paula. Um, how do you see initiating value-based healthcare in long-term care facilities in light of the evident safety and quality gaps in many facilities? Uh, I could take a crack at that one too. Um, so we, we, we have one now that's under development. It's interesting that you asked about long-term care. So we have one uh, underway now around uh, incontinence and, uh, and, and wound care. And, and largely the, the focus of those, those products in this particular case is in the long-term term care market. And uh, we are finding uh, there to actually, again, instead of using incontinence products, uh, we're going to buy an outcome from the use, right? Uh, uh, for instance, uh, you know, no, no, no diffuse ulcers, or you know what I mean. So we're buying, we're buying a particular outcome, not a particular product. And long-term care is as ripe as acute care. Uh, there's no, I, I really think there's no difference, and really. In that vulnerable population, I think you can really shift and improve improve the service that we're offering to that population through value value based initiatives. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I think the the foundational principles of when to apply these types of constructs still um, applies whether you're in an acute care setting or a long-term care setting, what are the biggest unmet needs um, for the institution and what type of outcomes are we trying to drive for the population served? 
um, and working backwards from there. It's about what um, combination of uh, products, processes, uh, services are going to deliver that outcome and how can we assign a value and a measurement system that will allow us to capture um, the right uh, uh, combination of products and services and the right value. And so um, the that foundational equation of, you know, unmet need, combination of technology services and solutions and how we define value against those is the, still the same foundation across the board. If I, if I could add something, I think one of the things with long-term care that we need to remember is that if we're looking at the perspective of the people we serve, then uh, there is a tendency in long-term care to focus on uh, family members and visitors as a proxy for the people who are actually receiving care in our long-term care settings. And we just need to be cautious about that because there is a tendency to believe that in long-term care residents um, are too frail or have too much cognitive impairment to be able to provide their views, their um, insights into what really matters to them. And we have shown the work that we've done in British Columbia that that is not necessarily the case. And we've done some differential item functioning uh, evaluations, analyses, that show that um, people, even with cognitive impairment, can tell us what's really important to them. So that's not to negate the value of family and visitor input, but to ensure that there is also an opportunity to engage with um, residents. And I think that that's sometimes forgotten when we are looking at who we bring to the table to inform that important piece of what really matters to the people who are spending 365 days a year, 24 hours a day in our care, that really, if there's anyone that should be able to provide input on what really matters, it's the people who are in that kind of care arrangement. Mm -hmm. It's about building the, the whole picture from 360 degrees. Um, Lena, there's another question here um, from Michael Barrett. Um, were there any challenges in translating evidence into practice at a management level? Um, well, um, I guess, Michael, if I'm interpreting your question correctly, then when I um, had the slide that showed our three streams, one of the important pieces of our work was to be able to look at what would be the return on the investment, how could we translate value for senior leaders, so management, in terms of recognizing that taking frontline clinicians who were responsible for the day-to-day -day, um, work with patients related to IV therapy away from their work to backfill them, to pay them for their time so that they could receive additional education and um, improve their competencies so that in turn, that would result in better outcomes and better experiences from patients. And so that became a whole work stream. How do we get the attention of senior leadership? How do we get the attention of stakeholders where we need to be able to demonstrate that return on investment? So I hope I, hope I interpreted the question uh, correctly and have provided some insights into how we uh, attempted to do that. Perfect, thank you. I don't know, Ron, if you have any any thoughts on that translating evidence into practice? Yeah, so, I mean, the, the big part of value-based procurement is data, right? Mm -hmm. So any of these any of these procurements to, to for instance, uh, the, the, the diabetes project that I talked about, uh, to actually make, to, to work that contract uh, and to properly uh, over the term, we need information on, on, on how the patients are doing with the intervention. So, so data and evidence are, are, are basically the foundation of value-based procurement. And without, without both, really, uh, you're probably on a fool's journey. <laughs> And as, a, as med tech organizations are on the learning journey, I think understanding where our customers' baselines are 
uh, is really critical, right? We want to understand what we can change and what we can shape um, and be very realistic about our product's role in the context of driving the outcome. Um, it, it may be a full player. It may be a part of a bigger solution. And so mm -hmm. data is really important for us um, in med tech as uh, you know, a starting point in understanding where those opportunities are to make a difference, but also the adjudication process. As we enter into these agreements, are we confident that we can collect the right type of information to demonstrate the value of the role of our um, intervention in the overall outcomes? And those are things that we need to think through. Um, and that's really where the fun begins, right? That's where the complexity is, um, but that's also where the solution is. I would add one. Um, I would add one more point to that, and that is that um, frontline leaders, senior executives, everybody's overwhelmed with the volume of data. So I think it behooves us to be able to package that data in a way that it has the key messages, the key metrics that are presented in a way that people can easily understand. I think we underestimate um, the fact that we, it's not so hard to collect the data. It's hard to present it in a way that it can become actionable. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And on that note, we're gonna wrap up. Um, thank you very much to the presenters for your time today and your commitment to the improvement of health service delivery. So Arthi, Ron, and Lena, thank you. To those from BD who supported bringing us this webinar today, Nadia, Sherry, Jennifer, thank you very much for the work you do. And on behalf of the college team, that includes Roshni Mitchell and Amy O'Brien, we'd like to thank all of you for attending today for your commitment to lifelong learning demonstrated through participation. Reflecting on the context of the pandemic, the content of the webinar, and such a great turnout today of health lead, our health leadership network, in the, in the words of Helen Keller, alone we can do so little, but together we can do so much. So thank you everyone, please stay safe and we'll see you again. Thank you.